Okay, good morning. Let's begin. I, um, I want to start today with uh, a small reminder. So, reality check. So this is the agenda. And we are now in week three. Okay? And today, assignment two will be released with a bunch of questions from this lecture. So, we're moving. And at the end of this week, I want to see some topics. I've been receiving a lot of topics in email. I will need to respond to those. I have prioritized by responding to people that don't seem to be able to get into Turnitin for some reason. You should really try before you send me an email. You're clever people, you should fix technical problems and look in your email, find the passwords I sent you. Uh, but if you didn't receive anything, of course you have to let me know. Okay, so topic selection at the end of this week. But today we have innovation, which is a really interesting topic. Uh, but I want to, now that we are week in, uh, week left of this uh, selecting a topic, of course if you need more time, you can take more time. But I have some ideas. So this is the theme. You choose something you're interested in. It's, you know, spending weeks writing about something, researching something that you hate is not a very good idea. So what I want to do is I want to come up with um, <coughs> some ideas. OK, so I deliberately didn't want to post this uh, early because this is because I want you to think. And now you have two weeks of thinking. And now I can share this with you. So these are just these are just random ideas that I put down. I usually write this on the board, but it takes more time. So I'm going to go through some of these. And if you have questions, comments, if you have ideas, please share them and, and we can go with this. Uh, let's just go down with this. Lifestyle. Now, things are changing. Um, and I, I will talk about generation changes also. There are, because there are the, the generations that are now in the workplace, 20 to 30 to 40 to 35, they're different than generations before. And that means that a lot of things change, lifestyle changes. Uh, and the wallet, textbook, CDs, what does this mean? Uh, changes in commerce. We've been way, I, I founded my first company in 1993. And that was an e-commerce company. But nothing happened. E-commerce, it took 10 years for e-commerce to happen. Amazon was probably the only thing. Uh, change in money, we are finally seeing this with Apple Pay and all these payment methods that people are starting to use their smartphones to pay for stuff. And there is a more stronger prediction that money, as in you know, cash, points is sort of disappearing <coughs> slowly. It takes time, but it is changing. And lending money, crowdfunding, the banks are worried sick about this. The banks are getting disrupted, and they, they're having meetings about this right now, talking about this. What are we going to do? What's the future of banking? Uh, idea building, Kickstarter, what does this mean? Hiring. Uh, LinkedIn is... You know, if you need to do a resume, a CV, you do it on LinkedIn. That's what I do. You know, the university asked me for a CV, and my CV was way old because I never applied for any jobs. I just create them. <laughs> so, but as a faculty member, you have to have a CV. So I filled out everything in LinkedIn and sent them the link. Here you go. Uh, this is the only thing I'm going to update. <laughs> We're not going to update some document. CVs um, are now in LinkedIn. And also, we're seeing jobs change because, I mean, if you're good in something, programming, for example, or 
good in art, graphical design, music, composition, whatever, you need a job, why don't you go on these sites like Elon's, Otesk, whatever they're called, apply for a job, put in your resume. And what happens is that uh, you take all your skill sets and the company that is a need some talent to work for them, they put all the skill sets that they require. Now there's algorithms to match this. That's new. And, that, and this is why, I'm sorry to say, but university de degrees are kind of getting obsolete. I'm really sorry to say this to you <laughs> because that's your call. No, you're fine. Uh, it's going to be valid. But what is going to happen is that... Yeah, maybe. But my point is this. Why do we have degrees? It's a communication tool. So I apply for a job. I'm a computer scientist from University of Oregon in the US. And all I have to do is tell this. I'm a computer scientist. And they're looking for a computer scientist. Nothing more. But they're ignoring everything that I've done. All the experience, all the this. Uh, I watched a YouTube video. I took a course in IOS programming last summer. What if I could take all of these things and put them in my CV? Everything. I and mean, the CV is like 2,000, 3,000, 10,000 items of things that I've done. I read this book, boom, in the CV. And then they match it. So university degrees are changing. Think about this. Gamification, uh, can you make people do things they hate, but they look at it as a, as a game? and do it gladly? Yes, you can. <laughs> Psychology, this is really interesting. Just a book about the multiverse. Yeah. Okay, um, solo mo, that's the social, local, mobile. That was a buzzword a few years ago. Uh, what's the impact of social networks, local, mobile? You know, this is something that we have had papers on, social interaction. Uh, things are changing uh, in, in retail a lot, uh, social interaction in, in viewing, in TV, uh, and social networks. Another thing is identity management, uh, universal, universal identity, virtual identity, uh, like in Square. Uh, uh, in, in Square is a payment method. You walk into a, a shop uh, and you take up your phone and you log in. And then when you go and order something, uh, they can actually see a picture of you on their cash register, which is an iPad. So they have an iPad. And they will say, ah, oh, this is 520 something. And then they will press your face and it will be charged to your Square account. You should generate com culture, content. You know, if you think about it, uh, we were, my company, my gaming company, uh, we were looking at YouTube streams Saturday evening. We got together. And there was this guy that was playing our game. And he was, or there were lots of guys playing our game. And they were talking. You know, what is this? What is that? Ah, I pick up this. Ah, gears. I have to follow them. So they're just talking while they're playing the game. They're really funny, by the way. One of them had 1.4 million views. 1.4 people are watching this guy play the damn video game. So this is a person that decided to be a YouTuber. So they just make content, make an episode a day, maybe two episodes, playing games. And they have, this guy had 8 million followers. Something has changed. You should generate a content. In the 20th century, it was very few people that produced stuff. Very few people. And they were broadcast by TV station and radio stations. Gatekeepers that decided that you should watch this. Uh, issues with the law. I'm always having emails from YouTube telling me that I was playing a song <coughs> that I was not supposed to. That's why I turned down the music before the Hangout started, <laughs> so I don't get these emails. Network effect, what if you can make computers for $20 and give them to people in areas like in India where the, where the average wage is much lower than in the West? 
what impact would that have? So you have access to everything. You have access to TED lectures, to universities, Stanford. You have access to all of these things. What will that change? Yes, in the new Raspberry Pi firebox. <laughs> yeah. <coughs> Very small. You know, it's it's difficult small. to have. A, it's so difficult to have just, you know, it's power. Than a credit card. Yes, smaller than a credit card. Raspberry Pi. Exactly. Uh, Tablet, what did that change? Uh, we see tablets all over. Professions that used to use paper, they're finally using something else. Now, a lot of things are happening in human-computer interaction. Uh, even brain communicating. But new input, touch, gesture, uh, speech, uh, these machines are getting so clever, like we saw with the, with the machine intelligence, just finding out the space that they are in. It used to be that computers were really just processing machines. Now they can actually, and the only input was like keyboard and mouse, practically the same thing. But now they understand voice and they can be aware of their space by vision. So they know where they are. Electronic paper, newspapers of the future, you can actually have device displays that um, you can bend, fold, web as a platform, applications moving. This, is, this has happened, you know, flash silhouette, it's gone. Uh, semantic web, web that understands things. But the API revolution really changed the, 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 the web, took it to a new level where you have all these programmable things. You can talk to websites using programs. Internet infrastructures. What is really interesting here is uh, in the old days uh, when my company, which was called Bethware by then, uh, it took us like two months to create a data center. So we would go on location, stay there for, have people stay there for two months, getting hardware, wiring up everything, all the switches, routers. Today you can actually do this by going into a software page and say, okay, I want a firewall here, I want a, this thing here, I want to have two computers. Now let's have four, this is the memory, then you press go, and it's ready. You have a data set. Something has changed. Cloud computing, now, what does it mean for IT departments? Why do we have IT departments? Surprising amount of people are not as computer literate as we would think. I think they should just figure it out. Yeah, but I have. I used to work at North in a university. No, I think you're right. I, I think you're right. There, there, there are things that need, need to be told. You're absolutely right. But uh, you can move a lot of IT stuff into the cloud but you might need a person to help you. This is the program that we use. That's not an IT problem. That's a human read what I have a problem. Uh, anyway, in 2006, I wrote uh, an article about cloud computing. <coughs> uh, and there was a reason for this. Uh, because I had to, I had problems getting things done due to IT department. And I said, you know, Let's get rid of this. New business model, free services, computing as a utility. This is Amazon and those guys. Will cloud save the Moore's law? Well, it already has. Future of operating system. You know, a few years ago, it was really, you know, the operating system was really the focus of everything. What operating, is it going to be? Who is winning? Well, Microsoft, Windows, Mac OS, Linux. It was this war of the OS. Who cares today? You know, even the browsers don't care. You just need to go on the web. What I will run an app that uses the web. So this has really changed. The desktop metaphor, well, that's dead. Definitely dead. What, what's the desktop metaphor? I will talk about this, but the desktop metaphor is that your operating system is or organized as a desk. The first operating systems, like Windows, they were like desks. So you have file manager. And the file manager looked like a file manager where you put papers in. Yeah, actual files. Yeah, 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 yeah. Documents. Uh, everything was, and then you had documents. It was like an office, like a desk. 
and you would have your filing cabinet. So they were trying to take the experience of an office and put it into a GUI, graphical user interface. That was their goal. Today, what do we use computers for? Well, we do documents, but browsing the internet, browsing the internet yeah, uh, reading, playing YouTube videos, watching YouTubers stream games. That's what we use. We use it to communicate, not to send the email. Well, maybe, if you're old as me. <laughs> but um, all sorts of things. So the desktop metaphor, that was the sort of uh, keyboard mouse. And now we have so much other things, gesture. Uh, we have all these apps. And we definitely don't use the desktop metaphor in smartphones. I mean, you can probably hook up a keyboard to this, but I've never seen one too. Nobody do this. Virtualization. Virtualization is the uh, looking at computers as software. So what if you take a data center and make it a software data center? Then you can create data centers on the fly. It changes a lot. Data centers, uh, you know, this is for those that are into technology. But TV technology, now TV has always been something that is you know, people are waiting for the next big thing in TV. Is TV going to be next big? You know, TV is just a screen, big screen. And uh, there are a lot of experiments. IPTV, uh, death of the TV station, over the top TV. Netflix is over the top. That is why your network bandwidth sucks in the evening. Because, you know, the people in the street, they're watching Netflix. And this takes a lot of bandwidth from the pipes, 37% in the US is Netflix traffic. Now, digital government, online voting, a lot of ideas about this. Can the web improve democracy? Healthcare records, do you wanna share those things? Do you wanna upload your data, everything, your health data to some private companies database. Would anybody want to do that? Why not? If they will come and tell you, hey, this is what you need to do. If you don't do this, you will be dead in 10 years. There's a lot of regulation issues there, right? Personal. Yes, there are a lot of regulations. Uh, and that's one of the problems that people need to solve. Can you do this? Uh, there are people that have in their cars a tracking device that will track their driving style, whether they speed, you know, how they drive. Now they take this data and send it to the insurance company. Now why would they do that? Well, they get lower premium. So, and also it makes them drive better, less risk of accidents. They know they're being tracked. So they behave responsibly. Everybody wins. So the idea with this preposterous <coughs> actually can make sense for people if you allow this. I mean, privacy is gone. Privacy is dead anyway. Gaming, a lot of gaming stuff. Casual games, multiplayer games, games and society, meaning that, one, 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 for example, games drive technology a lot. One of the enabling, the last question in assignment one, the correct answer is computer games. So the question was, what are the enabling technologies for making machine intelligence happen? Computer games. If anybody answers this, I, I will be happy, but I doubt it. Because computer games need graphical processing units, and they drive development of graphical processing units, among other things. Really fast floating point calculating machines, okay? Now, having all these powerful processors, you take 16,000 of them and you can teach a software to recognize cats. That was the story that we, so the enabling technology for machine intelligence is of course these, these graphical processing units, these, the power that we have, the big data that we have and all of these things. Gaming drives technology a lot. Virtual reality, that's of course huge. Um, 
convergence of things. Um, not sure if it, new business models. That's very interesting. So, like, I mean, how much do you pay to use Gmail? Nothing. Well, don't they make any money? Yeah, they make billions. <laughs> Another example, Flickr. That was a very good example. You can put your photos there, free. It's a community of people that take pictures. And you can see other people's pictures. You can share your picture with anybody. You can upload everything. You don't pay anything, but still they make money. How do they make money? And another thing is you can upgrade to a pro account. And the pro account costs money. Now it turns out that the cost per user is so low <coughs> that the 1% that actually pays will pay for everybody. And they still make profit. Now we have a scale that is so huge. Business model changed. And those that figured this out, they, 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 they created these services. And also moving from the economies of scarcity to abundance. Because if you think about it, in the past, we had these plastic discs for distributing music. So if you wanted music, you went and bought the plastic disc. Uh, they're still around. Yes, they're still around. And you can buy them. <laughs> and you can also buy LPs. But it's not the mainstream way of music. It's not, well, it, you might find exceptions to this, but it's not mainstream. Um, now, there's one problem with this method. And that is, there are only limited number of stores. There are only limited number of shelves in the stores. So it's very likely that most of the stores will have the same music because people prefer this. They will not have some obscure music coming out of some country by an unknown artist that you know and only you, and you would buy it, nobody else would buy it. They can't carry that. So you have to have rock stars and pop stars and all these stars, so everybody will buy them, because that's the only thing available. Now, if you take this model away, put it on the internet, you have abundance. And suddenly, you can actually find songs on Spotify that nobody wants to buy except you, very few people. It's available. And that's the economy of abundance. Content distribution of the future, Web3 technology. I'm, I'm not sure if Web3 is a concept. There was a Web2, Web3, that was sort of the HTML5 thing. The app internet, that's very interesting. Future of search, payments. I think the future, there's a theory that I have. You have different stacks of data complexity. Search is one thing to manage data complexity. But when search becomes useless, you need something intelligent. So instead of you going to Google and searching, the next step after this is Google coming to you and saying, hey, here's the thing that you're going to search for, that you were about to search for. Because we know this. We, we know what you're doing. And this is the scary part. But people can do this very cleverly. So if you book a trip somewhere, the ads that pop up, they will be about the other place and your interests. So if you like to go to pop concerts, the ads will be pop concerts on these dates in this country where you will be. Predictive intelligence trying to outsmart you. And people will freak out until they find this very convenient and then they will freak out because a service doesn't do this. So you walk into the store, and the guy comes, hey, here's the shirt that you want, in your favorite color. Now what are you going to do? <laughs> you will probably punch it. I mean, I think it will fight. <laughs> but why does he know? He, then in a few years after this, if you walk into the store, and the guy is clueless, doesn't know who you are, nothing, then he will punch him in the face because he's not providing service. So things get creepy first. And then they get normal. Future, okay, payments, we got that, technology and education. 
you know, virtual teachers, why do I have to stand here? Why not a hologram of an artificial intelligence that just real time, maybe that's the future. Maybe I have a few years left in this. Uh, I think education in general is really, really outdated. And one of the problems that, you know, I would like to teach as a game. It would be a game. And you would not be allowed to, con you can start any time and you can take whatever pays and you get bonus points, that's the assignments, and you will level up. You can't go to the next level until you have finished this level. All the game concepts, put them in a course. And the only thing stopping this is, <laughs> is, is we don't have the tools. It's difficult. We don't scale. And I also think that the education method of last century was about facts and speed. For example, uh, if you look at um, compulsory school, Grunskoli, the, the home assignments that 10 years old, 12 years old have is about speed. So you have to multiply two three digit numbers and there are like 100 pages of this. Why is that? Because you're getting up to speed. Do you need this today? Do you need to memorize everything? You go to law school for five years just reading when you can just do search. So you have to know basic, how general, how things work, and then you search the rest. Maybe that will be the thing, but we still have, we're still teaching the kids speed and cramming facts into their head instead of putting general knowledge and then you can figure out the facts because all you have to do is to, if you need to calculate two numbers, it's here. And we're dependent on technology anyway, so. Okay, digital technology as time tension. <coughs> yeah, 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 time tension. Delaying, <coughs> shifting time. For example, if you have a favorite show on TV, if you still have that, you're not gonna go through red light to get home to on exactly on this time to watch it. You can just watch it any time. Time shifting, play shifting data. We hear a lot about big data, data visualization, math, war of the futures. I'm just randomly picking this, uh, just taking this topic as we go down the list. Robots, unmanned aerial vehicle. I don't like that. That's been very popular in the past. Can you fight a war 500 miles away using video screen and gaming joystick? That's what they do in the US Army. So you go to some bunker in New Mexico or something and you start at eight o'clock or something, and you take this joystick and you take your drone and kill some people, and then after your shift is done, you go home and have dinner with the kids and, and the wife. That's what they're doing. <laughs> and they still suffer the same physical or psychological syndromes that if they were in the field. This is why the Americans don't need to send troops, they just have them somewhere in the desert and control these things. So a lot of technology in war. Um, domestic help, this is huge, this is, this is now. We have seen uh, a lot of robots emerge actually into the homes right now. One of them is, for example, uh, there are a couple of things you can buy, one from Amazon, small devices that you put on the table and listens to everything. And you can ask it a question. I will show it to you later. Also, cultures like Japan, they, they, have, they are very robotically mind, minded. They, they like robots. It's in their culture. One problem that they have is that they are getting older. The generations are getting older. So they don't have people to take care of all the old people. And this is why they're introducing robots. Robots that can help people stand up. Just devices. Think about the vacuum cleaner, a little bit taller and you can actually sit on the robot, and the robot will take you. Robots that can go and get you a glass of water. They can actually do this, they can, they can do stuff. But robots today, they're actually very primitive. Um, they are, but they are getting better fast. And I was listening to a podcast, and you know, they were talking about these advances in robots. And uh, now the guy that was interviewing, doing uh, the host, 
he was kind of saying, oh, this is scary, man. They're going to take over the world. They're going to kill us all. And, and then the other guy, oh, well, it's not there yet. Relax. I mean, it's very difficult to have robots just open the doors. That's difficult for them. So just close the door and you're safe. That was the answer. But it's getting there. When they can open the door, <coughs> you should be scared. Uh, and, you know, wireless opening thing. Local, WhatsApp, and Foursquare. This is sort of the, you know, I'm here. I need a restaurant. Ding, show me. And this act already exists. Health issues. Sensors. Your phone monitors your health. There are a lot of solutions where you just, if you have a RAS or the kids has a RAS, you just take a picture of something and they will tell you what it is. Also monitoring smart toilets. It will do medical checkup on your stuff and tell you, wow, you need to drink less or whatever. Or you have a disease here. <laughs> and also we talked about this future transportation, you know, uh, self-driving vehicles. Uber is on the road to, their mission is to have a bunch of Uber vehicles driverless. And uh, and that brings us to how you organize cities, electronic cars, navigation, stuff like this. That's the relational data business. Now we're getting technical again. You know, no SQL, this, that movement. Uh, a lot of things changing in, in, in computer science. Battery technology. Now, I've been waiting for batteries that will last 10 years. You know, you never have to charge your phone. Two years is okay because people switch their phone every two years anyway. Also batteries that are bigger than this. Batteries that are like three football fields. The problem with, for example, electricity is that the supply and demand is real time. So the electricity that is powering the lights in this room, it was created a few seconds ago somewhere and doom, transported here. That's problem with renewable energy, like wind, solar, because the sun goes down and the wind is not blowing. We need fusion. Yeah, yeah, fusion, that's coming probably. Uh, people have been talking about that for many years. But what if we could take all these renewable stuff and put it into a battery? Because the cheapest way to store energy today is, to, is water. You have a lake up in the mountain, you keep the energy there and then you make a dam somewhere on the way down. And when you need energy, you just take water from the lake. That's the cheapest way to store energy today. What if you can have this huge battery? You can even have ships that are huge batteries and, and charge them and go then and put a city to plug in a city or something. It will last for a week or I don't know. But, you know, try to escape the things that you already know. Think outside this. Cybercrime, that's the story of 2015. All these people hacking. It's a big business today, free speech. Uh, what about uprising in Egypt, Iran? You know, when the, when the uprising was in Tehran, um, I, I watched the feed from Twitter CNN didn't have anything. The news outlets didn't have anything. But Twitter had everything. And you can see the pictures of people getting shot and stuff like this. And even when the Twitter had the maintenance uh, scheduled. So they were taking the service down. And this was in the middle of the uprising in Tehran in 2010, or think. And they had planned this in long in advance. So it was a weekend, Sunday. They were going to take the site down for a few hours and then come up again. They had scalability problems. We really needed to do this. And then they got a phone call from the White House saying, no, you're not going down. This is the only intelligence we have, Twitter. <laughs> people taking picture, tweeting in Tehran, normal people in the streets. So technology is really changing. And companies like Google, they've been giving away Free stuff just to allow people to do this. Machine intelligence, now we're into interesting stuff. I, this is what I added this morning. 
can, what tasks and can I do, impact on the job market, a lot of interesting stuff in this. So I will share this list, I will clean it up a little bit, throw out some outdated stuff, and then you can uh, look at this.